It's a privilege again to be here with you all tonight. And again, I want to thank you and your pastor for inviting us. You know, I, uh, I'm going to share my testimony just briefly in just a second, but when I was, after I got saved, one of the things that impacted me a lot after I got saved, I was 20, um, were the hymns, the, the hymns that we sing in, in our churches. And I just, I love, I still love singing the hymns because of the, just the deep doctrinal and, and rich, <coughs> richness of these hymns and the meaning that they have. And it always blesses my heart when we can sing the hymns like that. I've got a message for you tonight. I, I preached on the heart of a servant this morning and, and we're going to kind of stay with that, kind of stay with that theme. But before I do that, it's, it's not a long message. Before I do that, I want to just share my testimony with you a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I've, we, were, we traveled around raising support so we could go to Spain. And so one of the things I always did was I shared my testimony because it allows, you know, when you're in a church, maybe just for a service or even for a day, it allows the people and the speaker to kind of bond a little bit, right? You know, when we share a testimony of something that God has done in all of us, in one way or another. They're all different. All of our testimonies are different, but it's something that God uh, has done in you and He's done in me as, as He saved us. Uh, my wife and I, as I explained this morning, she grew up in Spain. Uh, she went over there when she was three. Her parents were missionaries, so she's pretty much been around the Bible, been around church. Christ has been the center of her life for, for all of her life. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I grew up, um, I didn't go to church. We were what you would call CEOs, Christians on Easter and um, <laughs> or Christmas and Easter only. Yep. So uh, that's, that's how our family operated. We just, you know, every once in a while we'd go to church. So, you know, God and the Bible were far from my thoughts. I didn't really care about those things as I was growing up. So when I got into high school, really the main thing I wanted to do was focus on sports. I love sports. Um, from the time that I was a young kid, I mean, when I was five years old, my dad put a golf club in my hand, and I just, I loved all sports. So I wanted to become a professional athlete. That was a dream of mine. And so I would work to that end. And so after high school, I graduated. I went to the University of Central Florida in Orlando, and I walked on the football team, and I made it. And I was excited, of course, because that was another step towards the dream and the goal that I had. Um, so I was redshirted that first year, and I practiced with the team. And after um, that season, we were going into our spring training, and I got injured. And so it was an injury that pretty much ended my career. It was a career-ending injury. Uh, I wasn't able to come back from that injury. And so I was devastated, of course, because from the time that I was young, those were the dreams and aspirations that I had. And I didn't really know what to do and where to turn. Um, so I had to get a job because I was, you know, now I had all this free time and needed to help pay for school and those things. And one of the other things that I enjoyed doing was cooking. I had, I had um, done some cooking competitions when I was in high school. So I went and I got a job at the Marriott. And they had a culinary program there, and I got a job there. And it was on the first day of that job that I met a co-worker and his name was Darren Wolf and he was a Christian and I immediately noticed something different about his life immediately noticed that he just had a different countenance always a smile on his face he didn't joke around and tell some of the dirty jokes like all the other guys in the kitchen he was just different and I noticed that you know what there's something about him that that I don't have and that people I was around didn't have and so he befriended me and one day he invited me to church. And we were up in Orlando, of course, and his church was in Jupiter, Beacon Baptist Church. That's where he was from. And so he invited me to church. He just invited me home with him for the weekend. And so I said, sure, you know, I'll, I'll go. And, and of course, we went to the church. And I was 19 years old at that time. And that was the first time that I had ever heard a clear presentation of the gospel. You know, churches I was used to going to, they would open up the Bible, they would read a passage. And then they would close it, and then they would just tell a story. They would talk about something totally different than what they had just read. And so this was different. I walked into that church. Everybody was friendly. The pastor was friendly. And when the pastor got up to speak, he opened the Bible. He brought out the text, and he preached from the Bible. And, you know, God began working on my heart that day. And so it was, it was a matter of 
of many months to where I had started visiting that church off and on. Of course, me being in Orlando, I would have to go down with Darren or Eric was another young man. And so during the summer, I moved down there. I got a job and uh, I started going to that church regularly and started hearing the true gospel, started hearing the Bible preached every Sunday, every Wednesday, and God began working on my heart. And it wasn't long that pastors started asking in a service, and I remember, I remember it vividly. I was sitting on the third pew on the left-hand side, and pastor would say during the invitation, you know, maybe God's speaking to your heart. Maybe you need to come forward. Maybe he's dealing with you. And, and you know, I felt, honestly, I felt this burning inside. I, I didn't know what it was. But it was conviction. I know what it is now. It was conviction. And it took me about five weeks before um, I was finally ready to realize my sin. And I did. On, the, on that fifth week, I realized my sin, and I trusted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And you know what? God changed my life that day. He changed my life. Um, I became a new creature, a new person in Christ. And so God used a series of events to um, allow me to begin reading the Bible and allow me to get into His Word. You know, one of the greatest things that we can do as Christians is to get into His Word. Simply, simply just read it. And allow the truths to affect our life. Allow God's Word to change our life. So, as I started reading His Word, God began working in my life. And um, several months after I began reading His Word, God... God called me into the ministry, into full-time ministry. And from that point forward, um, God has, has done a work in my life, and He's still working in my life. Still working in my life, and I, I still remember the day. I still remember the time before God changed my life, before He saved me. I still remember that time, and I remember it because it's always good for us to think back to those days. So that we don't get complacent in our Christian lives. Remember that time where, where we were on fire and where we first met our Savior. And so today I, wanna, I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Exodus in chapter 4. Because as I began to grow in my Christian life, there were things that, that I believed God was speaking to my heart about through His Word. There were things that God wanted me to do and of course, I had, I had questions. And I'm sure we all have had questions. As God works in your life, you read your Bible, He speaks to you through your Word, through His Word. And I'm sure that we all have questions. Exodus chapter 4, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5, a very familiar text. The Bible says in verse 1, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto me. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand, take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord... God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto thee. So I'm sure that most of us know this story pretty well. Maybe we learned it in Sunday school, or, you know, as, as in my case, I was older, so I learned it just through, as I started reading the Bible. You know, Moses had been on the backside of the desert for 40 years, tending the sheep, when he came across a burning bush. And God had a plan to deliver his people and he was going to use Moses to do just that. In chapter 3 of Exodus, we see that God not only reveals himself to Moses, but he reveals his plan to use Moses to deliver his people from Pharaoh. Now understand for a moment the magnitude of what God is saying to Moses. From our human perspective, God is asking this 80-year-old man, Moses, to go up against the fiercest, most advanced nation in the world a lowly shepherd against the most powerful ruler of the day. Furthermore, this is the same Moses who grew up in the very house of Pharaoh's daughter. The same Moses who was mocked, who was ridiculed by his Hebrew brethren when he tried to take matters into his own hands, 
and killed the Egyptian slave master. So I think that we can understand Moses' hesitation. We can understand his trepidation when God reveals to Moses that he will lead and deliver the entire Hebrew people from the hand of Pharaoh. I am sure that we have all felt like this at times in our life. When we know that God is leading us to do some kind of task, maybe we're supposed to talk to that certain person. Quite possibly, we need to forgive someone that is just unforgivable or did the unforgivable. Maybe we need to exercise some of the fruits of the Spirit in a certain situation. Whatever it is, we feel just like Moses did as God asked him to deliver his people. We see in our text, Moses said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee, and the Lord hath said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. You see, God's answer to Moses' statement is so profound and really shows us the very heart of God, the mind of God, when it comes to fulfilling his purpose and his plan. God is not preparing a massive army to send with Moses to accomplish the task. God is not leading, loading Moses up with the most advanced weapons and technology of the day to face off against Pharaoh and his armies. God simply says to Moses, What is in thine hand? What is that in thine hand that you already possess? What do you have, Moses? And he said, A rod. A simple shepherd's staff. Shepherds use this simple rod or stick to lead their flock and to protect them from wild animals. And God, as we know, is going to use what Moses has in his hand, a simple rod to lead his people from the bondage of Pharaoh. So briefly tonight, I want to speak on the subject of, you have all that God needs right now. And let me say this, that's not to say that God needs what you have. God doesn't need anything in that regard. Rather, it is a statement that says you have, right now, enough. All that you need, actually all that God needs, for Him to fulfill His will in your life. You see, when God asked Moses what was in His hand, it was a reminder to Moses that as a shepherd, as a man who no longer held the future golden scepter of Egypt, but the rod of a flock of sheep. It was a reminder to him and a reminder to all of us here that God loves to use and usually places in our hands the simplest things to do his greatest work. That way he gets the glory. What is in thine hand? And Moses looked down and he said, Lord, it's really just a stick. It's a simple rod made of wood. And yet God said, that stick, Moses, that shepherd's rod is all that I need to deliver my people from Pharaoh's empire. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your word, that we can learn from it, that we can read from it. Father, we, we, just, we thank you for you and what you have done for us that you sent your son to die for us on the cross to forgive us of our sins when truthfully we are unworthy of it father just, father just thank you for this body of believers that are here today this group, this group of christians that are in this room today that are a light to this place this community thank you for each and every one father just work in their hearts tonight work in my heart Lord, we love you, and I just pray that everything that we do and say will glorify thee. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. The Lord said unto Moses, What is in thine hand? And Moses said, A rod. And God told him to cast it on the ground, so Moses did. And the Bible says that it became a serpent, and Moses fled. And of course he ran, right? Let me tell you that I think I would run too, and I bet you you would run too. I think most of us would run. Then God asked him to do something unusual. In verse 4, he says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. Now, I don't know much about snakes. I really hate snakes, to be honest. I loathe them. Um, just even the thought of them, the look of them, I mean, it, it just, they terrify me. But I've always heard that unless you're a professional snake handler, you don't pick that snake up by the tail. I think I would grab a rod or something and I'd just, I'd beat that snake. I, don't, I wouldn't pick him up by the tail. 
You know, in fact, that's exactly what I did one time. My son and I were out doing some yard work, and um, and the whole the whole scene was really comical, to be honest. But we were out doing some yard work, and he came across this big, what looked to me, this big, huge, long snake. All right, and so he said, you know, yell, Dad, hey, there's a snake, and of course, you know. I didn't want to tell him I'm terrified of snakes, but I'm like, hey, take care of it. Come on, be a man, you know. You go do something. Of course, he, I think he was, you know, 10 or 12 at that time. And like, yeah. so, so I said, all right. So I was trying to think of how I was going to get rid of the snake. And honestly, I didn't want to get too close. I mean, any stick I found was probably only this long, and I didn't want to get that close to the snake. So I went hunting around in the shed, and... and um, when, when we had bought our old house, we had there was a shed that the old owner left there, and he had left some tools. And so there was one of those big, long tools, you know. It's one of those things that you, I don't even know what you call them, that you saw off the palm trees with. I call them the Grim Reaper tool because that's what it looks like. <laughs> and um, I had one of those, and of course, you know how long those things extend. And so I grabbed that thing, and there's this snake, and I take that thing, and I'm telling you, I extend it as long as it could go, so... The snake was probably back about by your feet, and I've got this pole, and I'm just sitting there going like this, you know, whacking the snake on the head, and all, you know, I look to my side, and my family's standing there, not outside with me, in the house, in the window, just looking, laughing at me as I'm just sitting there beating that snake to death so that I don't have to get near it. That's how much I cannot stand snakes. And so, just as Moses, I would have done the same thing. I would have fleed. And he fled, and... That when, that serpent, when that rod turned into a serpent. You know, all this information is given to us literally for our benefit. When God asked Moses in verse 2, what is in thine hand? Tell me something. Why did God ask him that question? You know, it wasn't certainly for God's information. God knew exactly what was in his hand, but rather the question for Moses was a question for him. And it's a question for all of us. This entire prelude of the deliverance is a teach us some principles, some priceless truths about priorities and about powers that we would not otherwise have known. For example, the first thing I want you to notice in this story, number one, is a lesson about supply. It's a lesson about supply. You see, folks, God did not ask Moses to use what he did not have. His question was, Moses, what is in your hand? In other words, note this carefully, you may not have a graduate degree. You may not have a million dollars in your hand tonight. You may not have a ton of talent in your hand. You may not have youth or beauty or position or strength. You may not have any of these things that somehow you think that you consider necessary for fulfilling God's will. And there was Moses. God had a will for him to deliver this entire nation. He wasn't holding in his hand a crown. He wasn't holding a scepter. He wasn't holding a sword. So you see, not having something never limits the power and the nature of God. The fact that you do not have something is of no consequence to God, to the God of this universe. And God will not ask you to use what you do not have. Many of us have heard the phrase that when God calls, He qualifies. Consequently, the Lord did not look down from heaven at Egypt's great power. Remember, this was the world empire at the time. And God did not look down at Egypt's great power and say, boy, I sure wish Moses had something that I could use. I wish he had an AK-47 or a concealed <laughs> permit or something like that. Or, you know, I wish Moses had a nuclear device in his hand. You know what? He didn't do that. And ladies and gentlemen, the question tonight is not what, you do, what do you wish you had in your hand? And it is not what great things does someone else have in their hand for the glory of God. The question for you tonight, right now, is what do you have in your hand? In other words, what's your education right now? What's your IQ right now? What's your age right now? What's your health right now? What is in thine hand? So all that you have and all that you are right now is all that God needs for you to do His will right now. To start doing His will this very moment. You may say, I don't have a lot of money. I don't, I'm not educated enough. I'm not eloquent enough. I don't have the right skill set. The truth is, just as God recognizes, recognized that Moses had all that he needed in his hand, a staff. 
God recognizes that you have all that you need to accomplish his task. What is in thine hand? You have the Bible in your hand, right? It is the infallible and eternal, inerrant, inspired, life-giving, powerful, life-changing, sharp, discerning word of the living God. You have something in your hand. What is in thine hand? You know, every Saturday our church, my son's part of this, they, they, we have a group of teenagers that they go out into the community with their Bibles, with their gospel tracts, with church brochures. They go and they knock on doors and they invite people to church. And every Saturday, you know, my son's excited. He comes back and tells me about some of the people he was able to talk to. And they represent the local church, the body of Christ in our community. They aren't famous or rich. They're not eloquent public speakers. They aren't engineers or powerful businessmen or famous athletes. They are simply servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, who God can use for His honor and glory. And this is your church, right? here. You are the body of believers in this church and in this community. And in obedience of our God, He can use this church to reach the world outside of these doors. You know, the Bible says that our Lord Jesus loved the church and that He gave Himself for it. And regardless of the size and regardless of the location, the New Testament local church is the most powerful, life-transforming assembly in the entire world. When Jesus wrote letters, when the Creator of the universe wrote letters to people down here, He didn't write any letters to the capitals of various cities. He didn't write them to all the chambers of commerce or the universities or the military stations. The Lord Jesus wrote letters to churches. Big, small, rich, poor, prosperous, martyred. The sovereign Lord of the universe works today through and in the New Testament local church. What is in thine hand? A Bible, a track. All I'm saying this evening is that you have in your possession right now all that you need to be all that God wants and that God desires for you. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says in verse 4 that there are diversities of gifts. Paul says there are differences of administrations, there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God that worketh in all and through all. In other words, look, it doesn't matter what God puts in your hand as opposed to somebody else. What matters is that God desires and God will work in your life to fulfill His plan. Did you know that a lot of times people will use what they can't do to keep them from doing what they can do? You know, I can't go to the mission field. I just don't have that skill set. Or I can't run a children's home. I can't preach to the multitudes. And you know what? That's okay. But don't forget all that you can do. You can go to your own mission field, which is your workplace, out in your community, maybe your school. You can raise your child. You can be a blessing to your grandchild. You can speak to one person, if not multitudes. Whatever it is that God wants you to do that you're supposed to do, I've got news for you. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. It is a simple lesson of supply. A lesson of supply is that He did not tell Moses. God did not tell Moses to use what He did not have. And God's not telling you to do anything with regard to something that you don't already have. Number two, secondly, you will notice it is also a lesson about surrender. Note, caref note this carefully. God doesn't have you if He doesn't also have what's in your hand. Look at verse 2. And the Lord said unto him, What is in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. And it became a serpent, and Moses fled from before it. You know, it's true that in verse 4, God would tell Moses to pick up that snake again. But you see, what's illustrated here is that you have to be willing to surrender. You have to be willing to surrender what, is, what it is that God has placed in your hand for God to use what's also in that hand. God doesn't really have you unless He has what's in your hand. And so we need to ask ourselves, all of us need to, am I willing to cast, therefore, what I have? What God has given me, what hast thou that, that thou didst not receive? I am willing to cast what I am and what I have at the, at, the Lord, at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I willing to do that? 
the talent that you have, that ability, that diploma, that money, that position, is it yours, really, or is it his? In our church, the Lord has blessed us with so many young people. And I talked about the young people going out on visitation. A lot of our young people also, they sing in the choir. They play instruments in the orchestra. And uh, they sing specials in church. And you know what? They're very talented. Um, and, and they're such a blessing to our people. Every time they do something, you know, our people come up to them and they you know, tell them how much of a blessing that it was for them. You know, ten years from now, I hope that they remember that that talent, that ability, belongs to God. You know, I remember my wife's uncle, uh, she has an uncle, he's, a, he's been a missionary in Venezuela for many years. Many, many years, and as many of you know, Venezuela is just in, in shambles right now. People are starving for food. Uh, it's hard to get money. It's, hard, it's just hard to get anything over there. Crime is running rampant. Um, I've only met Deanna's uncle a few times because they've been on the mission field and you know our paths have only crossed a few times. But one of the things I always remember about him is that every time something would happen, maybe it was tragedy would strike, maybe something would happen in, in Venezuela, you know, some kind of tragedy, you know, maybe something in life, maybe something in the ministry, it just, you know, something happened that he would always say, you know what, it's the Lord's. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. I remember when their truck got stolen, he joyfully said, well, it'll be okay because it was the Lord's truck. You see, all that you have, all that I have, all that Moses had in his hand belongs to the Lord. You have all that God needs to fulfill your will, and we know that it is his anyway, so the question is, will we surrender it to him? It's a lesson about surrender. You know, as soon as you let go of your life, that's when God begins to do something with it. I heard someone tell a story many years ago at Christmas. They noticed that um, a Salvation Army worker, you know, we always have the Salvation Army workers standing out there. They're, they're ringing the bell and stuff. And they, they noticed this Salvation Army worker. They were in full uniform. You don't see that a lot anymore. And the worker had on his sleeves the familiar letters SS. And he mentioned that 100 years ago that that actually meant something. He was tempted to ask the man if he knew what it stood for. Because what SS stands for on the old Salvation Army uniform, it stands for serve, saved to serve. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the model for every Christian if you're saved here today. If you're saved, you have a high and holy purpose and calling. It may not be to deliver an entire nation from slavery. It may not be to write a book in the Bible but it is to serve the exact same God that Moses served. There is no difference between the God of Moses and the God of every believer in this room. The truth is, if you give what's in your hand to God, then God has you just as much as he had Moses. Which brings us to the last point in the text. We said, number one, that there is a lesson about supply. God did not tell Moses to use what he didn't have. We said, number two, there is a lesson about surrender. If God doesn't have you, he doesn't have what's in your hand. And lastly, number three, I want you to notice there's a lesson about success. Please hear this. It is when you give what's in your hand that God will change the ordinary into the miraculous. In fact, it's even greater than that. Look at verse 17 for a moment, if you would. The Bible says, And thou shalt take this rod in thine hand, wherewith, wherewith thou shalt do signs. Now wait a minute. You realize it was just a simple staff, right? A shepherd's rod was basically a stick that was about six feet long, six feet tall. It was used to whack wayward sheep when back into line. So that stick that Moses has in his hand, that thing really is going to deliver millions of people out of the bondage of the world empire? Well, sure it is, if it's let go. And if God empowers it. As you know the story, the rod would strike the Nile and it would turn it into blood. The shepherd's staff would smite a rock and water would come out of it. It would be held high and it would win a battle. It would divide the Red Sea and then close it back again. And of course, if that shepherd's rod was in existence today, can you imagine what would happen? Millions of people would have pilgrimages. They would wait in line just to get a glimpse of it. They would want to see just a piece of that wood. If I could just see a piece of that wood. 
Of course, they would be selling splinters of this so-called miraculous wood, all the while not realizing that it is not the stick. The stick is only made out of wood, and it's not the wood. It is what God does with it. It is what God does with what you surrender to Him. It is not what is or isn't in your hand. It's what God can do with what is in your hand. You may say, you know what, I'm just a teenager. I'm just a mom. I'm just a homemaker. I'm just a church member. I just sit in the pew. I'm just a teacher. I'm just an engineer. I'm just a construction worker. No, no, no. Let me tell you. Give what you have in your hand to God. And God can take the ordinary and turn it into the miraculous. You, might, you may not even know it. You may not even know what God did through your life the past five years or the next 15 years is miraculous. You may not know till you get to heaven, and that's okay. The real miracle, anyway, is that God simply wants our fellowship and our service to Him. What greater miracle could we have than that? You know, I remember when we were in Spain, we would always talk about that. You know, anytime you hear about Spain, you hear about people that go over there, missionaries that go over there, they call it the missionary graveyard. Okay, because missionaries would go over there and, and just nothing would happen and they would get discouraged and they would go home. So we would always talk about that. You know what? We're, we're over here. We're going we're gonna, to basically we're gonna, we're gonna sow the seed. We're going to get the gospel out. You know, nothing may happen in these few years that we're here or in the lifetime you know, that, that somebody's here. But guess what? God can take that and he can work miracles. Whether it's five years down the road, 15 years down the road, or 100 years down the road. I want to remind you that the entire purpose for God to use Moses and that staff was to deliver a whole bunch of slaves to becoming his people. And you realize that is exactly what salvation is. It's delivering those who are slaves to sin, to become the children of the living God for all of eternity. You see, when Moses surrendered what he had to God, something that was dead came alive. Every time he picked it up again, it died again. The secret to, to success is always, always surrender and letting God work through you. You know, it's amazing because after this text, this passage of Scripture, never again was a stick ever referred to as Moses' staff, not once. After Exodus chapter 4, it was always called the rod of God. It doesn't matter what's in your hand tonight. You know, Jochebed, Moses' mother, was a slave. So if we want to talk about our lowly situation, that maybe, oh, you know, we're only a teacher, we're only a church member, just a few sitter, or what you have, Jochebed was a slave. She was a slave in a slave nation, born a slave, destined to be a slave. All she had in her hand was straw. It's the only thing that uh, the Egyptians would provide to the slaves in that day. But she wove that straw basket to be a shelter for that baby, and all the hopes and dreams of the entire world and history itself floated in that basket. She had something in her hand. She did the best she could, and God worked the miracle. Christians in this room, God wants you to do something. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're a father, your mother, your grandparent, your employee, employer, your young person, old person, God wants you to do His will. To do God's will in your life. The good news is, is you have everything that you need to start doing it right now. Everything everything that God needs to start using you. All you have to do is just surrender it to the Lord. You know, maybe you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord as your Savior. I don't know if we're all Christians here tonight. God's message is simple for you tonight. You are to realize your sin and your need for a Savior. And by placing your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for what He did on the cross and calling out to Him, God will save you. The Bible promises that. There is no other will for your life right now than for you to put your trust in Him. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed just for a moment. We're not going to belabor the invitation at all. You know, God just he wants us to surrender to Him. He wants us to understand that what we have, who we are right now, who He's made us, what He's given us, is all that we need and all that He needs to be able to use us. 
And honestly, it's just all about surrender. It's all about when Pastor Price asks you to maybe take up the offering or to go do this or to go do that. Just surrendering to the Lord and saying, you know what, I will do that. I will do what I have. I will use the talents and the abilities and the gifts that I have, Lord, for you to serve you tonight. Our Father, we love you. We thank you so much. And we're grateful for this time that we have together. Father, we're thankful that you have given us all that we need. We don't have to be this famous person with lots of money. We don't have to be this person that has all the knowledge of the world. We don't have to be this person that is, is famous or is great in the eyes of others. We can just be who you've made us to be. And Father, may you use us now. May you use this church, this Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, this group of believers, to reach their community, to serve you, to love you, and to be the church that you would have them to be. We love you. We thank you for your goodness in this time. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Thank you for that timely message, Pastor Andrews. Before you leave today, be sure to thank the Andrews family. They drove all the way from Jupiter to fill a very important need for us today, and uh, we're very grateful for it. I'm very thankful for them as well. Thank you, brother. You guys are dismissed. Have a good night.